monster movies have a long and storied past dating back to the 1920s, with one of the earliest being Nosferatu. Monster video games have been around since Death Race appeared in the arcades in 1975 with the goal of the game being to run over humans, I mean gremlins, to increase your score. On the Atari 2600, we had Halloween and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and it's continued to the present day. One of the earliest examples of violent imagery in a video game which appeared a full four years before Mortal Kombat was Platterhouse. What was the issue between Paramount and Namco? Let's find out as we slice and dice our way into the history of Splatterhouse. The year is 1987 and Namco designer Shigeru Yokoyama has noticed a trend in Hollywood. Right in the middle of the teenage hack and slash craze, Mr. Yokoyama wanted to create something that would appeal to teenage boys across the world. No stranger to designing arcade games, his previous credits include QDQ, Galaga, and he would go on to work on such hits as Time Crisis, Rage Racer, and Super Smash Brothers for the 3DS. He wanted to incorporate elements from Evil Dead, Friday the 13th, and Halloween, but put his own unique spin on it. The story, as it was so elegantly told in the TurboGrafx-16 comic book advertisement, Rick and Jennifer are seeking refuge from a storm so they decide to go into the Splatter House. As they go inside, the door slams shut and Jennifer screams. You awaken in a dungeon, deep below with a terror mask, or in some versions called a hell mask, fused to your face. This gives you supernatural abilities with superhuman strength. With your newfound abilities, you have to make it through the Splatter House, defeating hordes of monsters to rescue Jennifer. This was one of the first games to let you essentially be the bad guy, killing hordes and hordes of monsters with your weapon of choice. You have the ability to punch and kick and also jump. You also have a special move which is a drop kick. This will make contact with all enemies that are nearby. You also have the ability to pick up weapons. This is when the real blood and gore begins. Scattered throughout the levels which you can pick up to dispatch your enemies with are a 2x4, baseball bat, machete, chainsaw, harpoon, shotgun, lead pipe, and a forgotten head. This game did not have any rating on it aside from a simple warning on the TurboGrafx-16 box. The horrifying theme of this game may be inappropriate for young children and cowards. However, if you look at the back of the box, it's labeled for ages 10 and up. There are seven levels in all and a mini boss at the end of each one. The game was released a full four years before Mortal Kombat, yet did not have the same cultural impact. Perhaps it was a lack of digitized sprites making it not as realistic? The game is very gory and violent, and in this day and age would have received at least a T rating. Copyright laws are, shall we say, a bit lax in Asia, which would explain a lot of the bootleg merchandise coming from that part of the world. The terror mask that Rick wears is clearly ripped off from Jason Foreys in the Friday the 13th franchise. There were rumblings of some sort of agreement with Paramount, who owned the rights to the franchise, but negotiations failed. They were forced to change the color of the mask to red to avoid looking too much like Jason once the home conversion launched in America. Speaking of home conversions, the very first home version of Splatterhouse is actually an LCD handheld game. From the reviews I've read, it plays pretty good, with creepy Splatterhouse music in the background while you play. It was released only in Japan. The first and least well-known would have to be Splatterhouse Wanpaku Graffiti for the Famicom, which was released in 1989 in Japan. Rather than attempt a straight-up arcade conversion, which they clearly could not do on the system, they went for a QC super deformed take, and it worked out great. Sure, it's not the arcade game, but it's reminiscent of it, with a lot more 1980s horror movie spoofs and pop culture references included. Also, there is a lot more platforming action. New to the series is also a password system, which was later implemented into future games. The violence has been toned down since this is primarily designed for kids, but the game plays really well. Over here in America, we received the standard TurboGrafx-16 commercial. 
So, you want to know the story of Splatterhouse, the new horror video game for TurboGrafx-16? They say he stalks the old haunted mansion. They say he's looking for his girlfriend. They say his only weapon against the maggot-eaten ghouls who took her is a two-by-four. And you say you want to play this game? Splatterhouse. Only for the TurboGrafx-16 system from NEC. In Japan, though, they received a creepier version for the PC Engine. PC Engine Splatterhouse Namco. There were two conversions of the arcade game released for home consoles. The first one is a pretty much arcade perfect version for the FM towns in Japan. The FM Towns was a Japanese computer by Fujitsu, which featured many good arcade conversions. This conversion is really well done with CD audio and excellent graphics and playability. The other conversion was for the PC Engine or Turbo Graphics here in America. The conversion is very well done with large detail sprites and great playability. The problem with the American version was that it was censored quite a bit. All religious imagery were removed, including crosses and altars. Leave it to Cleaver to be the only weapon to be replaced in the home version. This was replaced with a wooden stick in the first two levels. The enemies bleed quite a bit less and the sounds are not as gruesome when they die. Ironically enough, the golden axe in level 4 was replaced with a meat cleaver. All wooden crosses are replaced with tombstones. The inverted cross boss on stage 4 was replaced with a severed head. There are more edits to be found, so I will leave the link down below for anyone who is interested. In 1992, Splatterhouse 2 was released for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive. This time around, the Terror Mask reassembles itself and goes back to Rick, telling him that Jennifer doesn't have to die. He is instructed to go back to the Splatterhouse to find her. The game features even more grotesque bosses at the end of each stage. Along with the standard punches and kicks, you have a few more moves at your disposal, along with brand new weapons to use. The terror mask was changed to more resemble a skull and not so much like a hockey mask. A password system was included as well as a difficulty setting. The gameplay is very similar to the first one, almost a bit too similar. The game feels like Splatterhouse 1.5 as opposed to a true sequel. In 1993, Splatterhouse 3 was released for the Mega Drive and Genesis. It has the dubious distinction of being one of the first games that was given a rating by Sega's own video game rating council. It was rated MA-13 for graphic violence and gore in North America. Taking place five years after Splatterhouse 2, Rick and Jennifer have married and have a son. They have purchased a mansion somewhere in Connecticut, but the terror mask feels its ancient energy starting to build. Rick must don the mask for a third time and defeat the hordes of monsters that have invaded his mansion. The game feels like a true sequel, with four possible endings and branching paths. The game features non-linear exploration, forcing you to backtrack as you try to find your way out. New to the game is the power-up system. If you collect enough orbs, Rick will transform into a giant hulking monster who is a bit stronger and able to take more damage. Over the years, Rick and the Terror Mask have made cameos in various games including Point Blank 3, Family Tennis for the Game Boy Advance, and Tales of Eternia for the PS1. In 2003, released only in Japan, Splatterhouse was released for the Windows platform. Running under emulation, this is essentially an arcade perfect game. In 2010, Splatterhouse was released for the PS3 and Xbox 360. This was a reboot of the original game, with the same plot pretty much intact. Doing away with the standard side-scrolling, your character is able to move in all three dimensions. If you like blood and gore, this is the game for you. Buckets of blood will be spilled just by sneezing. Well, not really, but you get the point. Various weapons are at your disposal, just like the previous game. Rick can now use his super strength to tear his enemies apart. During the battles with enemies, it is possible for one of your limbs to get severed, but it will grow back over time. Throughout the game, Rick will collect blood from defeated enemies. Doing so will unlock more moves and power-ups. The game is a lot of fun to play and really captures the feel of the previous games. 
The game received moderate to positive reviews when it was released, but I enjoyed it. TurboGrafx-16 version was released on the Wii Virtual Console back in 2009. Since this was the American version, it was censored, but it played just like we remember. The game was also released for the iPad back in 2010 to coincide with the release of the reboot. Despite using touch controls, the game played pretty well, with plenty of violence and gore. The action is nice and frantic, and the music is really well done. That about wraps it up for the history of Splatterhouse. If you like a little blood and gore with your coffee, this is the game for you. It's great fun, especially in short doses. It doesn't matter which version you try, the censorship is not that big of a deal as the core gameplay remains the same. If you would like to support me on Patreon, please visit the link below. Also, make sure you like, subscribe, and share my channel if you enjoy my content. It's the only way my channel can grow. Thanks for watching.